So I'd like to welcome you all to our program tonight, Driving Analytics to the Point of Care. Our speaker tonight is going to be Mark Chagru, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about Mark. He's currently the CNIO at UMass Medical Center and the Associate Chief Nursing Officer of Professional Practice. Mark has been a leader in New England informatics for more than 20 years. He has been an active member of the Nursing Information Systems Council of New England as a past president, BANIC, and a founding, active in the founding of NENIC. Mark Holder has held several leadership positions in local and national organizations and is on the HIMSS U.S. Board of Directors. He's widely published, including a contributor editor to author to one of the most well-respected books in nursing informatics, Nursing Informatics, Saba's Essential, Saba and McCormick, Essentials, Essentials of Nursing Informatics. He's a frequently sought after speaker and an adjunct faculty at Regis College. Please help us welcome Mark to the podium. So are we going to hand on the phone with this? So should I use the um, level air? What do you think, Sandy? All right. I wonder, yeah, but I didn't want to get feedback if they can hear it. But we'll try this. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah? Okay. So, um, Mary asked me to do a presentation driving analytics to the, to the point of care. And this was actually, um, the thought here was that I would leverage a presentation I had done at the HIMSS conference, and I think it was a 2016. 16. The car that presentation was a co-presentation. I presented along with the folks from IBM Watson. How many of you have heard of IBM or seen, seen Watson on Jeopardy and all that? Okay. So I had the privilege of being able to uh, co-present with them. So what I did was I sort of modified that presentation a little bit, but I really wanted to bring home the point of uh, analytics and what it's all about. And so what I'm going to do is, um, whoops, does this not go this way? I don't. Down. I'll just use this. No, I got it. So, um, what I'd like to do today is just talk a little bit about definitions, just so we all level set what is analytics, some baseline on, on all that. Um, talk a little bit about the historical perspective because I found it fascinating. I actually did a little more research for this presentation than I did when I did him. And there's some really interesting stuff I'd like to share with you, just, again, to level set more so than anything else. And then what I'd really like to spend most of the time doing and looking for some feedback from you is I've got some almost case studies of examples of um, how um, driving analytics to the point of care can really impact patient care and impact change. So I want to spend most of the time um, talking about that. And I call that applied, um, applied analytics. So that's the, um, that's the agenda. Um, Let's start with just, you know, sort of analytics. What is it? What's the best way to think about it? And um, I like this definition. I hate Wikipedia, but this was actually a good uh, definition. You know, the academics all say, stay away from Wikipedia. That's always a good starting point for some things. And I think for those of you who might be new to informatics, um, analytics is the discovery and communication of patterns and data. And, um, you know, it's driving here thinking about this. It's, it's almost like, I, I need the data to speak to me. I need the data to talk to me. What's it telling me, right? That's what we need to learn from the, from the data. So I think that's a, you know, a key thing for us to uh, keep in mind. Fading in and out. Okay, so let's give it this. Maybe. All right. I can stay at the podium. Yeah. Is that better? You guys on the phone? Yeah. <laughs> I'm fixed? Okay. Yeah, walk away. My dog was fixed. I'm not fixed. <laughs> Trust me, I have All right. three reasons to prove that I am not fixed. <laughs> so I, the other one definition I wanted to share with you guys is artificial intelligence. That's another one that's out there. This was all over the HIMSS conference this year. What is it? What's it all about? And um, you know, where, where can we get a definition about, about that? And I am going to be talk a little, talking a little bit more about artificial intelligence tonight. But really, um, when you think about this, I went to another really great source on the Internet, Google itself, because Google really is in the artificial intelligence business. And why is this important? This is coming soon to you. We're going to talk about this in a minute. But um, it's one of these things that we as nursing informatics professionals really need to get our arms around and our head into uh, what is artificial intelligence. But it's the theory and development of computer systems able to perform tasks that normally require human intelligence 
such as visual perception, speech recognition, which I'm going to talk about tonight, decision making, and translation between languages. How many of you know Siri? You met Siri, Alexa, okay? That is a form of artificial intelligence. And again, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that um, in a minute. So we can't have a nursing informatics discussion without going back to the baseline, right? You all should be familiar with this, uh, this graphic. But what does it start with? It starts with the data, right? And that's always been um, sort of the, um, the, the mantra, if you will, of, of nursing informatics. It's data, information, knowledge, and wisdom. But it really starts with data, and I think that's where we come in many times is if that data is bad, the rest of it's bad, right? So we need to make sure that we have high integrity in that data and that we really understand what it's all about. And as I've progressed in my career and done implementation work and have done research and development work, and it always comes back to the data. Uh, regardless of where you are um, and what aspect of informatics you're practicing in, because there's many, um, really the foundation continues to be that, um, that data level. So I wanted to start with that, thinking about data, but take a step back from a um, historical perspective and look at some data. So how many of you know that Florence Nightingale is a well-recognized statistician in data, right? In our, right in our own profession? We, we should be the stewards of this based on this. So um, have any of you ever seen this before, this graphic? So if, you're, if you haven't, it's basically two pie charts, okay? And what these represent are uh, casualties of war during, during the Caribbean War Crisis when Turkey and Russia were at war. Um, now, this was in the 1800s, right? So this was before hospitals. This was before antibiotics. This was way back when Florence was still trying to convince people to wash their hands like we're still doing today, right? But just to um, orient us to this, because I, I think it's important to understand what we're looking at in the data, and I'm going to hope this works. So each of these pieces of the pie represent a month, and you don't have to, I understand this is an eye chart, you don't have to read it, and it's not important for you to read it. But the bigger the slice of pie, the more the deaths that occurred during that month. And you can see here, this was the first um, wheel, the first month before Florence got on site and started to do her thing, and the war was really ramping up. The color definition here is fascinating. So the black color um, here really represents those um, injuries that were classified as other. So uh, we don't know, it wasn't a war-related injury, it was another reason why the person died. So for example, um, you know, somebody may have died from a seizure or some, some other uh, type of thing. These pinkish ones are actually the ones that were tracked back to wounds, wounds of war. So only those pink ones. Everything else, anybody guess what every, all the other deaths were related to? Disease. Yeah, infection and disease. And again, a lot of that we know today was related to poor hygiene that was in that area. So you look at this and you think about, you know, Florence Nightingale trying to advocate for her patients and trying to advocate for, um, you know, better conditions for the soldiers during the Crimean War. And what she did was essentially kept data of all of this information so that she could share it with the powers to be. Now, you'll notice that the slice of the pie is decreased in those periods where um, there is more red. Those represent particular battles. If you trace it back, you can tie this to um, particular um, battles that occurred during the war. But you still see that, by and large, the slice of the pie is made up of um, things other than war-related injuries. So here, we're, we're looking at the data, and this, this is a visualization of the data that she tracked. Um, what we learn is that by the time that she left the Crimean crisis in 1856, the conditions of the hospitals in Crimea improved drastically. So this represents uh, a reduction from 42% to 2%, just in her work alone to make that happen. But probably more, even more fascinating that the same data was really used as the foundation for um, establishing the concept of a hospital, right? And so, and it wasn't, and they realized really quickly, it wasn't the um, Russians <laughs> Uh, were a minor enemy here. The real enemies were the disease, cholera, typhus, and dysentery uh, that was causing the problem. So you need to be able to look into that data. They saw the death, they knew, but if you didn't know otherwise, you'd assume a lot of those deaths were related to war-related injuries, right? But her data really helped us to visualize that differently and look at it in a different way. Um, if any of you who are interested in this topic of visualization of data, it is an important topic. 
And many of my uh, nursing academic friends who really study visualization concepts, I'm going to be talking about a case study where at Leahy we sort of visualize data in a different way. This book is probably the premier book of data visualization. It's um, by Edward Tufte, and it's called The Visual Display of Quantitative Information. Again, a really great um, slide. You will read this book if you can get through it. I'll be honest, it's a tough read. Uh, but if you can get through it, you'll leave it and never look at a pie chart the same again. Um, you know, you'll never look at data quite the same way um, as you did before reading it. So take a look at that if you have time. Any of you heard of this one, the Back Bay Golden Goose? This is another fascinating local story right here in, uh, in Massachusetts. And again, I won't um, bore you with the, too much of the details, but this was fast forwarding a little bit from the Korean War to 1915. Right here in Boston, there was a physician by the name of uh, Ernest Amory Codman. Dr. Codman had this crazy idea that he should be tracking outcomes on his patients and actually walked around with little index cards where he would track whether his patients lived or died, improved or deteriorated. And he really proposed to the Massachusetts Medical Society, at that time led mostly by Massachusetts General Hospital, that they become more transparent with their uh, with their data outcomes. And what do you think the response was of the MGH doc? <laughs> oh, hell no, we don't need to talk about that, right? So what this graphic was, he was very uh, vocal about his objection and he was really ostracized and really forced out of the medical society. But this ostrich buried the head in the sand, that's intended to represent the surgeons who were just burying the heads in the sand, really mass general, burying the heads in the sand. The golden eggs were the patients who were bringing revenue <laughs> in. And uh, really, this was uh, one of those landmark cases where you think about the idea of data again. He was keeping track. He had all of his mortality data at that time, but it was so foreign to everybody else that they just couldn't, uh, they couldn't accept it as part of, the, um, part of the norm. So this is actually in the Countway Library right here in Boston. If anybody ever get a chance to get over there, um, it's really a great... Um, sort of blast to the past, it um, actually served as the uh, impetus for the development of the Joint Commission. Ultimately, if you trace things all the way back, this work and Dr. Codman's work here um, is what many can uh, point to as the founding or the beginning of the um, outcomes movement here in the United States. So again, data, 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 right? Got to have that data, got to be transparent with that data, have to have reliable um, data. But we've been at this a long time, right? Lawrence, Codman all the way back to the um, 1915. So let's, let's fast forward a little bit and look at sort of computing and where we're at. And this is always, you know, those of us who have been in informatics, you think about the, uh, the old days, and some of us have been in longer than even this, right, where com centralized computing was the thing. Um, mainframe technology, that's where I started. Um, you know, the old big IBM mainframes, right, um, as the computing uh, software. In 1990, I had the opportunity at Meditech to convert them from mainframe to client server. That's just another way of distributing technology across a broad, broader platform. But then the internet hit in the 2000s, right? We all know what happened there. Exponential growth and ability for um, sort of using the World Wide Web to even further evolve computing. And we're headed along this mobile path. How many of you now are working on mobile uh, solutions. I know I am and we, where we are. You know, it's all about mobile, right? Getting it, in, uh, bring your own device, getting it into the hands of the user at the point of care. Um, and ultimately, we're heading in some are already there in the, in the cloud. But this has been a very fast progression, right? A very uh, fast progression of uh, computing technology um, along the way. And this is just another uh, way of looking at that when we think about the old days. We were running cards through the uh, machine, right, to uh, tabulate. That's basically what was a big calculator. Um, in 1950s, it really became programmable. We could actually put some logic in there and say, do this, then that, or if this, then that. But now we're heading into this phase, and this is where IBM Watson comes into play, where we can actually go back to our data information knowledge and wisdom spectrum and think about cognitive computing aligning with that knowledge component, right? really using data to help start to think in many ways like, like we do. So that's a good um, point where I want to uh, pop into this. How many of you have seen Hidden Figures? Great movie, right? Uh, if you haven't seen it, go see it. But I'm going to set the stage here. So Hidden Figures is about a group of women who were working for the uh, NASA during the uh, shuttle development, the initial shuttle um, development. 
And they really um, were the brains behind the development of the uh, figures that we use to calculate all the trajectories and all this in the days before we really had ubiquitous computing power available. Again, awesome movie, get a chance to see it. The point I wanted to make with this is that the um, folks here really had to transform their work. We went from being uh, pencil pushers, calculators on the desk to really being programmers to program the logic. And I think we're seeing that in the nursing informatics field as well, where the thing that I did when I first started in nursing informatics is not what I'm doing today, not because my job has changed, but because in part because the technology has, um, has evolved so quickly along that. Um, so the, the um, idea that we've really leaped from you know, this, this, these days of, uh, of the IBM platform to now where we're talking about Watson competing on Jeopardy is just uh, fascinating. How many of you heard of big data, the term big data? That's out there, right? It means a lot of things to different people. Um, it means many things to many people. Uh, but to me, it's really about getting all the data that we need for our patients, right, to be able to do what we want to do. Um, but today, data is just ubiquitous, right? It's out there. It's everywhere. There's data on our phones. There's data that we put on Facebook. There's data that we, um, we contribute through the Internet of Things, whether that be our Fitbit or whatever that might be, right? So. Um, other industries, like the retail industry, for example, have figured out how to get at all that data and how to get some visualization and make something meaningful out of that. Have any of you read the book Habit? Another, this is like Mark's reading recommendation, right? <laughs> Not that I read all that much because I don't have time, but this one's a really good one. Habit is a book about um, really picking up on little sort of um, subtle changes that people can make, whether it's um, you know, you're trying to make weight loss a habit or you're trying to make exercise a habit. But one of the things they talk about in the book was about how the retail industry is using data to look at habits of shoppers. So there was this one segment in the book that I pulled out, which was um, really this um, father who was irate that the uh, target in his area was sending um, prenatal coupons to his daughter. <laughs> well, as it turned out, Target had an algorithm that it was using that looked at many different things like, were you purchasing multivitamins? Were you purchasing you know, uh, certain other types of um, things? They actually, in the book, even talk about how not only can they figure out you're pregnant, but looking at some of your patterns, if you know the sex, they can tell what sex you're going to have. So they'll push coupons to you for boys versus girls. So, oh. Thank you. You've seen the whole hidden figures movie. Um, so the point with this is that the data is out there. Other industries have figured out how to manipulate that data to their advantage. I'm not so sure that we should be giving Target as much as we do because apparently they know more than we do. And in this case, this is a real story. This wasn't made up. This dad um, ultimately had to apologize because his daughter was pregnant and the data was right. So, um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that's data today. Um, now let's bring this into healthcare and talk a little bit about where we are here. So I, I've actually presented this slide before because I've always been troubled by the fact that we have spent so much time and energy on the EHR, right? The electronic health record. Everybody is focused on the record, regardless of who your vendor is. We're spending millions, and in some cases billions of dollars at the institution level to implement these records to capture information on our patients. But when I really took a step back and thought about the patient, right, and if you think about the average length of stay in the United States, I grabbed this off of, you know, of our U.S. Department of Health and Human Services website. The average uh, length of stay in hospitals is 4.8 days. We're actually lower than that here in Massachusetts in many cases. Um, and you think about um, the patient, well, the patient's alive for 365 days in that year, right, <laughs> not just the 4.8 days that we have them. And when we think about it, that little slice of the pie, if we're going back to the pie chart, is what we capture in the EHR. We're not capturing whether or not Mrs. Jones took her Lasix when she went home. We're not capturing what her patterns of uh, retail shopping are at Shaw's or Target or anywhere else, right? That data is there, though. It's part of what is big data. But I think it's really important for us to realize as informaticians that 
We are spending a boatload of time, energy, and resources on a very narrow slice of the data pie. I'm not suggesting that that's a bad thing or that we shouldn't be doing that, but we need to become increasingly more aware that if we are going to be entering the data age and looking to use data to help our patients, that there's more to the pie than the EHR. Okay? And that's all I'll say about, about that. I'm still eyeball deep in the EHR. I get to do the uh, implementation thing all over again um, at UMass, which I'm really looking forward to. We go live in October. Um, so I'm living this like you guys are day in and um, day out. But we have to keep it in perspective and realize that there's much more, much more out there. Um, I love this. This was um, uh, the Dean and Professor of Health Policy, uh, Health Manager at UC Berkeley, uh, talking about big data. It's getting bigger all the time, like no kidding, right? That more and more data that is out there. And when you really start to combine things, you can start to do some really fascinating things with the data, um, you know, to what Sarah was talking about, connecting the dots, so to speak, like right? looking at different um, data pieces. Um, and really what is going to become very quickly our problem is not the data, it's analyzing the data and the analytics. How do we take that data, those, that volume of data that would fill up the pie, and convert it to meaningful um, information? So I don't know about you guys, but um, reporting maturity has been a challenge for me uh, from, from the beginning. And so, you know, I, when you dummy down informatics to its core, right, it's, a, it's the same as computer science, in, out, right? We've been spending all of our energy, I think, on the input, getting the data into electronic health records and forms and flow sheets and whatever else we create to input data. The output side is really the reporting and getting stuff out. Um, I, I know I've been challenged with our vendor to try to extract data from, that, from the electronic health record. We have a commercial uh, solution, right? Just trying to get that information out can be a challenge, and folks are spending hours and hours and millions of dollars Again, on just that little O, trying to get the, what you need out of the system. But there is a maturity curve here. And we think about descriptive analytics as tell me what happened, right? Tell me what happened when the patient fell. Tell me what happened. Um, why did it happen is a different question. And that's where our diagnostic analytics, we come in and do a little bit more fancy analytics on that same data, but we're really able to answer the question, why did it happen? The predictive analytics is the really cool stuff in which we're really headed. And Sarah touched upon this, too, and a, a passion of mine is I want to predict when that patient is going to deteriorate or when that patient is going to go into full-blown sepsis before they become septic, before their lactic acid is peaking and dropping and all that stuff, right? So that's where the predictive analytics comes into play. And again, other industries are doing this already with their data. It's already being, being done. And then lastly is the prescription, prescriptive analytics, and that's really the how can we make it happen. And that's really using data at a whole other level to actually guide treatment and to guide um, how, how and where we are head. So I don't know about you, but this is the best picture I could find. You know, um, I, I plan in part of my new role to, um, within the next week, throw on scrubs and get on the floors because I really need to see what it's like um, out there with our current system before we convert to the new vendor. But I have a feeling that it's going to be like drinking from the, uh, from the data fire hose as a nurse, right? You just, whether you're dealing with paper or electronic health records, you're just, as a nurse, inundated with information coming at you from all angles. And your job and, you know, with your five other patients is to try to figure out which data is most important. What do I need to know? What do I need to act upon? But it is like drinking from the, um, the information fire hose. Um, I thought this was really good because we talk about data. We talk about how much data, right? Um, this was really interesting. You think over on the far left-hand side, the megabyte, we all know what a megabyte is, right? Um, it's, but if you equate that to something physical, it would be a tiny ant. A gigabyte, now my kids are now requiring the 32 gigabyte iPhones, right, because they put pictures and all other things on there. I used to run small hospitals on 32 gigabytes, I swear to God. When we first started implementing, we would run entire hospital data centers on 32 gigabytes. Uh, but if you think about the physical world, that would be, uh, you know, so the tiny ant was a megabyte, a gigabyte would be the height of a short person. Um, all the way up to, you can see where we're headed with this, um, you know, a terabyte being the length of the Auckland Harbor Bridge, a petabyte being all of New Zealand, and then the extra byte being the uh, dimension of the sun. This is where we're headed with our data, right? We, we have more data than we, we know what to, um, to do with at this point. You think about some of the, um, 
some of the hospitals that have been live on computer systems for a long, long time, whether here in Boston with the Brigham or uh, Intermountain Healthcare out in Salt Lake uh, in Utah, they have decades and decades worth of uh, data already on populations of uh, patients. And we're just adding to that every day, every single day. Um, I'm not going to go into this too much, but um, I, I, did, I would be remiss if I wasn't talking a little bit about other determinants of, uh, of a patient's health, right? Again, we're all focused on the data that we consume or we enter into the system, um, but 10% of that is really the clinical uh, factors, if you think about the whole, right? Another 30% would be the genomic factors, and we've, we've mapped the genome, right? So that's a, that's a real thing, right, where we are now really able to look at the genomic data at the individual, and you're already starting to see companies form for developing drugs specific to the individual, right? And then 60% uh, is all the other stuff uh, that's around us. What was interesting, though, is that still today, 80% of the data that we generate is unstructured. What does that mean? It means it's not the data that's in a nice little box that's um, you know, reportable. It's the free text data that is just text, right, which is much harder to report and to get out. So even though we think we're spending a lot of time in flow sheets documenting, we are, and we're spending a lot of time with uh, structured data, when you look at it at a patient level, still 80% of the overall data is unstructured, which is um, you know, going to be fascinating to think about from a reporting uh, perspective. So natural language processing. At Leahy, where I was um, before last week, uh, we implemented Dragon as part of our EPIC rollout. Dragon is a voice recognition system, so our docs don't type. Um, they don't type a history and physical. They don't type an op note. They talk into the phone, and the phone translates, just like you see with um, Alexa and what you see with Siri, uh, just sort of at a whole different level, right? And with uh, medical vocabulary behind it so that it understands what you uh, mean when you say certain medical um, terms. So this natural language processing component is out there. It's, it's um, one that was all over HIMSS this year. I saw um, one demonstration of a patient's room where there was a patient in the bed who said, Alexa, turn down, turn up the heat, and the room thermostat went up. Alexa, change the channel on the TV. Alexa, call my nurse. Alexa, who's my doctor? And it would show a picture on the screen. So. Um, it's there, right? That's the, we're not limited by technology for something like that at this point, right? We might be limited by other uh, things like resources, but natural language processing is evolving very quickly to a point where uh, we're going to see we're going to see more and more of it, and we need to be prepared for it in our um, practice environments. So let's make this actionable. So the first one, I want to flip into the case studies real quick. How are you doing time-wise, Mary? Great. Okay. So, um, as I mentioned, I was with Leahy prior to joining uh, Thing. I see Cindy's here. So, Cindy Clymer was uh, on my team there uh, and helped with this, this uh, case study. I'm going to explain real quickly what this was. So, you get this idea of visualizations, right? So, at Leahy, we were challenged, as I'm sure many of you are, with our inpatient influenza vaccination rate. We were horrible at vaccinating patients for flu during flu season um, that we had. Of course, you know, by definition, if you're an inpatient, you're vulnerable to the flu, right? You're sick. Um, so we, um, we recognized that we needed to improve that. We also recognized and gave, got a little kick in the butt from one of the insurance companies here in Massachusetts, Blue Cross Blue Shields, who was offering an incentive for organizations who could achieve 98% uh, or greater um, uh, inpatient influenza vaccination rates, which is a reportable um, item. So... What we did uh, was we thought about this idea of visualization, right? How can we provide a visualization to the nurse to make it so that the nurse could quickly um, understand whether he or she needed to do something for the patient? So simply put, I'm going to dummy this down, but I just know that there was a ton of work behind us. Simply put, it was the green check, red X. The green check was basically logic that said, yes, the patient was all set. Either they declined it or they had it or that some other reason that, that we built into the logic, green check was meant to the nurse, you're good. So this was, the, um, the, this was displayed on the uh, patient screen that the nurse sees immediately upon logging into the system. Green check, red X. Red X meant, uh-oh, you know, something's not right here. We need to do something. 
So we combined this sort of epic build. We built into the system this visualization of the data, not all unlike what Florence did with the red, black, and the pie charts, right? It just took the data and made it into something that was actionable, right? So um, what we did with this as well, uh, based on some feedback we got from the advisory board consulting group, we made a game of it, and we leveraged the um, a bug's life story, right? So the bug's life, bug being influenza in this case, uh, was used, and we made a game out of inpatient influenza vaccination rates in a competition between all of the inpatient units. And we reported very transparently, Dr. Codman, uh, reported every Monday the bug report, which would show the prior week's compliance with uh, inpatient influenza vaccination. What do you think happened? Rates went right up. Rates went up. We actually um, had an amazing uh, response to this and almost immediately uh, went to 98% compliance from 69% prior. Um, this came along with a $775,000 check from Blue Cross Blue Shield. It was all directed to the Department of Nursing at Leahy. So, um, you know, you guys know it takes a village, right? Thank you. Yeah. yeah. You know, we all have to figure out how to articulate the value of this, right? This was not me. This was a team. Um, this was in, my informatics team. This was the educators um, at Leahy. This was, most importantly, the operational leads, the nurse managers who owned it and developed this. But working with IS, right, to visualize that data and to make something out of it. Um, now they're thinking the nurse managers are all, all into this now. We've developed posters on it. We've accepted. Thank you, Karen. Accepted for Nina. Uh, we're really excited to share this at the annual conference here. Um, you know, they're thinking about other ways now that we can maybe move the needle on some other initiatives with the same thought process, uh, maybe different visualizations. Um, some of you may have heard of the uh, MUSE, uh, Modified Early Warning System. This is, um, again, to Sarah's point, um, a, a mechanism um, in looking at the data to figure out how do we um, prevent, uh, uh, you know, the whole reason we have the uh, rapid response teams, right, it's um, failure to, um, I feel like a capture. I get it. I have the uh, <laughs> failure to rescue. Uh, not failure to capture, but it might be part of the problem. Uh, but the whole uh, failure to rescue um, concept of the rapid response teams was because we weren't intervening soon enough, right? That patients were deteriorating quickly and, um, in worst case, becoming a code, right? A full, a full blown code. So the modified early warning system is a system that looks for these key indicators. And what's really fascinating when you start to look at some of the literature behind this and you start to look at it is you really can be fooled as a nurse, right? And by that I mean you can be looking at a patient and looking at the data at your moment in time and not really have the full picture and not realize that your patient's been on a very slow decline, right? But you're looking at a slice where um, things seem like they're, they're okay, but they're really not, right? So... We need to empower nurses with that ability to pull back on the data and to visualize the data from a bigger picture and say, this guy never had a rate in the 60s. He's, you know, why is he in this? We're, we're accepting 60 right now. This guy, he should never be in uh, the 60s. Or his blood sugar should never be where it is, even though it might be within the normal range, right? It's not normal for him. So um, I think you're going to see a lot more about this, the medical early warning system, same concept for um, septic shock, right? We're looking at the data to try to understand what are those key clinical predictors that are out there and push that information and visualize it to the care providers so they can um, intervene uh, quicker. Um, this was a case study, Hamilton Health Sciences. Again, all these are on the um, PowerPoint side. You can take them um, with you. We actually had a presentation, I don't know if you remember, here at Nenix several years ago. Um, was it Children's Hospital of Orange County? Um, that presented, they eliminated inpatient cardiac arrest on one of their units by doing something similar to this. Uh, this was way before the rapid response teams and the IHI work. But um, Hamilton Health Sciences, um, they did something very similar. They used, um, they developed their own um, early warning systems. And you can see for every 3.4 people we recognized to have a score of six or more, we saved one life. And this is um, Dr. Robichaud, who's actually in the picture here. She's the, um, the one in the, um, the white. Uh, in the middle here, who developed this uh, system that they used. And their outcomes were um, fascinating. So this was over a 10-year period now, but imagine that their inpatient um, in-house cardiac arrest went from 400 to 54. 
and again, I'm sharing this with you to start thinking about, you know, we're constantly talking about what's the value of nursing informatics. What, what do we bring to the table? What do we bring to the organization? When you start thinking about it in terms of clinical terms like this, it's really unbelievable the type of um, work that we can um, do. This is doable right now. There's no reason why with all of the data that we have in our electronic health records, even in that small slice, that we can't be doing some of this um, right now. Uh, Johns Hopkins is early on in this. One, one of the benefits that both Denise and I get for representing Munich at the national stage is we get so elbow to elbow with our counterparts across the country who are working on some really cool stuff. Uh, Johns Hopkins, um, you should look this up if you haven't seen it already. It's called the Targeted Real-Time Early Warning System, and they were published in August in uh, Translational Medicine, uh, August of 2015 in Translational Medicine on this work. And it's really an um, uh, algorithm to aid in the early detection of sepsis. And this is one of my passion points, and I believe firmly that we need to be doing better with sepsis. It costs us a fortune. So I think if nursing can sort of um, own this and come up with ways of using the data, to, um, just like we do with flu, to really intervene quicker and demonstrate um, that we can um, sort of prevent the deterioration to septic shock, that we can really add um, a tremendous amount of value. What's interesting at Hopkins is, um, they, so they've got the science around the algorithm, right? They know what we need to look at. And um, this was, I don't know if any of you have ever, ever done this, but this was a um, sort of exercise that they do when they have all these really smart people around a table and they have a um, person who's an artist who just sort of visualizes what they're talking about. So it's another visualization of sepsis. And, you know, they looked at what, what the um, different criteria were and what all the feedback was, and this was their um, visual, visualization of that. But even more importantly um, was they really found that the um, noticeable subtle hints was the big thing, right? That, that, that really, that in order to, um, to be able to see what's happening with this patient who's preceptic, it's real subtle. What are those real subtle clinical changes buried deep in the chart? That, um, that you need to get at. Again, you're a practicing nurse. You know that you don't have time to go look at all those subtleties, right? And you're focused on the here and now. Did I get that med in on time or not? You're not, you're not really thinking about, um, you know, all the other things that are there. So you need the technology to help you. Um, more than two-thirds of the time, the method was able to predict septic shock. So this is their algorithm, uh, was able to predict septic shock before organ dysfunction. And that is a 60% improvement over what we would do clinically without it. So think about that. That's amazing to think that the data is telling you something. We're just not visualizing that data. We're not reading that data. Right, the data is all there um, to prevent this. Um, but what they said, and these are direct quotes, um, it's really how do you operationalize that? Thank you up in Nenek, right? That's what we do. How do we operationalize this? Now that we have the data, now that we know we can intervene, at what point in the workflow do you exactly introduce that? Where does that come in? Who does it come to? Does it come to the nurse? If so, how? Does it come to the provider? If so, when? Um, you know, and you need to think about those things in terms of how to, how to do it. So that's the challenge. You know, we, we back at Leahy, we needed to figure out where was the best place to push that information to the nurse. Well, it was on, on login. We wanted it right there in their face on login. They, they get that information for um, the flu. We need to think about sepsis. At what point does the system, um, and how do, we, how do we get that information in the hands of the, um, the clinicians that need it? So they haven't done that yet. They're working on that. Um, I bring it here just to know that that's out there. And again, the challenge in this case, again, is not the data. It's not the technology, right? It's not the computers. We have, we have all that. It's how do we operationalize it, and how do we get this so that we can really be um, helping our patients achieve better outcomes. And then the last one I'll share is that right here in Boston, again, our friends at Children's Boston were, um, I have all the references in the, um, in the slide. I forget exactly where this was from. Um, but Ch Children's is piloting an Alexa-like um, function in the room. So this voice natural language processing function um, that would allow for, uh, again, visualization of the data um, using natural language. Again, it's where we're headed. It's where we need to go. And it's always a little scary in the beginning when we think about this, but I never would have thought that we would be able to convert our physicians from dictating into a phone to a transcriptionist who then types it up in wherever they are overseas and then sends it back and signs it to actually using a natural language processing. But they did. 
Um, and the technology, the reason they did is that the technology is good enough now that it recognizes their dialect, it recognizes their language, it recognizes those subtle medical terms that it didn't before. And I think the technology has advanced enough that um, we should be ready to, to greet it. So I'll leave you a couple of quotes. Um, I think of you guys all the time with this type of stuff. The real heroes are those who find a way to improve things around them through the course of their daily lives. In the nursing industry, there are many heroes who live fine, leave fine imprints of positive change because they deliver exceptional care to patients than what's expected of them. Keep doing whatever you're doing, and you could be one of them. And I think that's true for all of us in informatics, and I think we can continue, especially as a group, uh, finding ways that we can, um, we can demonstrate the value. Um, the last one I'll leave you with is a data quote. Uh, in God we trust, all others must bring data. And I think this is true. If you're not, if you're not a data-run organization yet, you, your job as an nursing informatics lead is to uh, make them become uh, data-dependent. Right? They need to become a knowledge-based organization that likes data, that uses data, and that we need to do the same thing on behalf of our patients. So that's all I got. I don't know, Mary, you've got time for uh, questions, comments? Let's see if we can get people up on the... Uh, uh, unmuted? Uh, unmuted. <laughs> Let's see if we can get them unmuted. Don't hit hang up. No. All right. Do we have any questions from the audience? Mark. Sure, Julia. I was just at a clinical decision support company called MedCPU, and we did the census work and presented at IHI between the neural language processing, prompting for the right test at the right time early yep. before they get work, and, and then the outcomes are they're right there. Yep. It really works. That's awesome. Yeah, and I think we need more of that, and I think we need nursing leading that. This is not one where we need to sit back and watch and see what others do. This is one we need to get in front of from a nursing leadership perspective and um, own it and lead it. Um, you know, again, the, the example I shared at Leahy, that was entirely nursing-led. There was, um, you know, we, we collaborated certainly with other disciplines, um, but nursing was in charge. Nursing led that. Nursing came up with the idea um, and implemented it. And I think we need the same. We need that same leadership. And I think they're looking to us for it. So, um, yeah, the more the better. All right. Do you know at Hopkins what algorithm they're using to try and get the early detection of sepsis? They're developing their own. So they've developed their own. Um, yeah. Yep. So what most places do academic medical centers like Hopkins, Partners, others, um, you know, that's part of their research um, mission is to contribute to new knowledge, right? So and I always struggle a little bit with this concept of, you know, we've got informatics, such a large umbrella. But we've got the research and the content of informatics, right, the stuff that we use um, to support our informatics work. I think what Hopkins is doing is they're contributing to that body of knowledge uh, themselves first to see, um, using their own data, if they can come up with those key indicators. But then that will become available to all. It's like everything that we use, whether it be the Morse scale or the, uh, you know, for, for falls or the uh, Braden scale for Again, there's research that's done to look about what those indicators are, but then the tool becomes available to, to others. And I think that's, um, that's, again, why the power of our group is so vital. We've got that representation here. We've got everything from the academics, um, the research, as well as the community hospitals um, that are um, able to leverage some of that information. The real challenge, though, like Hopkins said, the real challenge isn't the research. That they, they've got the research. The real challenge is how to operationalize it and how to build it into the workflow, and that's, again, where we come in. Yeah. Do you foresee uh, talk about natural language processing? Yeah. So one of the things I envision, probably not in my career, is that nurses walk around with a headset and they'll speak as they assess and never have to enter information manually into a computer. And that data will be be able to be structured and put in the right place at the right time. So one of the so um, at Leahy before I left, one of the nicknames that came up for me was Captain Click because we had implemented a new EHR epic, right? And we had such incredible click overhead for the nurses, right? And I'm sure many of you are feeling that already. And it's just sort of a natural sort of evolution of the input, focus on this input, right? Data, 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 data. And we do it on the backs of the nurses, right? 
And I think we need to um, think about that. And that was what I was thinking about as we head into optimization. I'm like, great, we can do whatever we want, but I don't want another damn click for a nurse, right? Whatever we're going to do, green check, red X, whatever it is, no more clicks. Um, but I think there might be opportunity for us to look at some of technologies like that, like natural language processing, and get back to some of what we had before. I miss the ability to go into a note and get the patient's story right from the last nurse who, who told that story verbally, right? This is a 36-year-old male patient admitted to the ED. Blah, 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 right? you, all know this, you all know the scenario, right? You can't find that in the EHR, right? You are looking all over the place, right? But wouldn't it be cool if um, maybe report to start was recorded, um, you know, shift to shift report was recorded using a natural language processing tool that could be then converted into a text that could then be structured, hopefully, uh, because we are able to do that now. We are able to take, in some cases, natural language uh, processing output and convert some of it to structured data. So maybe in our lifetime, who knows? But um, I'm optimistic that we'll get there. Yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. So wonderful presentation. Thank you. So this is both to you and maybe to me too. I think that you know it overwhelms me. I think a lot about AI, and I think about what will the role of the nurse be in the future. You know, we talk about the tools, we talk about dictation, we talk about um, analytics, we look at pattern recognition. And in fact, there's a great article in the New Yorker. Uh, I can't say his last name, but Siddhartha Mukhari. Anyways, about AI versus the MD, mm -hmm. and he talks about you know, for instance, you can uh, we'll be able to see and predict the types of dogs that people have in their car in 128, but we won't be able to tell which one will bite. Yes. <laughs> so I think, oh, that's good that nursing probably will be around to do that. But I wonder at the national level, if looking forward, I think one of the biggest challenges, you talked about flu yep. and the, the significant um, value to the patient and financially to the organization. But are there any organizations that you know that are really setting priorities say this is where nursing will make, this is what our patients may need, and this is how nursing can make a unique contribution, and we are going to own these areas. you want to go first to these? Let me go. Yeah. Um, so I'll start and hand the mic to Denise. <laughs> um, so I do think there are some organizations that are, um, that that's happening, where nursing is leading. I think many organizations are still in implementation mode and the uh, and financial crisis mode at the same time. I know that's been my experience where um, the, we, we can have all the visions that we want, but at the end of the day, it comes down to um, our, our viability as a business, as an organization, and financial constraints within the, um, within the organization. And I think that a lot of times the, um, the strategies really follow that, um, you know, for the, for the most part. But there are pockets where um, nursing is leading in, in front of. One that comes to mind for me is with this whole um, mobile compute, mobile um, technology, leveraging mobile technology, particularly for secure messaging. Uh, we were doing it at Leahy. Um, you know, there's a lot of emphasis right now on uh, finding out better ways to communicate between nurses, between members of the interprofessional team, between patients, et cetera. And my um, spin on that is that's really being nursing driven. Um, HCA, uh, Anna Baker, uh, who was from here originally, from Mass General, um, is leading a huge effort at HCA right now on that um, from a mobile technology perspective. Same thing on the West Coast at Providence Health. Um, those, those organizations have deeper pockets than many of us do, um, and they're able to make some investments that um, may, might be on our wish list but don't actually uh, make it into the um, budget for us. But um, good question. I think, you know, there's a lot of opportunity. And we, we need to be pushing our nursing uh, voice every day. That's why, um, you know, developing our next generation of nursing leaders is just so vital for us to make sure that we continue to do that. Totally agree. I think we have to get comfortable with the financial side of the business. You know, many, many of us as nurses um, will default to the quality side of the equation, right? We'll, we'll say, well, we made our patients safer, and we did. And we, you know, we, we prevented harm, which we did. But that resonates um, with certain stakeholders, but not all of them. Some of them want to hear uh, what, what is the financial implication of what the work that you're doing is. And we tend to shy away from that, but we need to, we need to grab it by the horns, and we need to be a little bit more aggressive with um, how we 
tackle and, and demonstrate value in not only quality terms, but financial terms for our institution. Yeah, you know, one of, one of my and the other initiatives I was working at at Leahy to talk about cost per click is we, um, we implemented our EHR very well for nursing. We did a crappy job for the docs. Um, and by crappy, I mean the, the, um, the build that we took from the vendor, again, Epic, um, was sort of defaulted to be very heavy on the provider. So a lot of the task overhead fell onto the backs of the providers. What we've since learned two and a half years later is that much of that work could have been and should have been shifted to support personnel within the clinic environment. So Leahy, 70% uh, of their revenue is outpatient ambulatory clinic environment. Huge, huge volume. Thousands of patients every day that they see um, up there in Burlington. And, um, you know, when you think about that volume and that work and shifting it to the providers that you're paying, let's say, 150 bucks an hour, 200 bucks an hour to, versus a medical assistant who could ask the patient whether they're smoking or not or could do some of those um, tasks. We were looking a lot at that. And, again, that's where the economic side of this comes in, and we just have to, um, we have to be open to that and we have to be uh, receptive to including that within our informatics practice. More questions. Any questions from those people on the line? Either you can, I don't think I can hear anybody, but perhaps you can type them in if you have any questions. All right, well, that being said, I have two things. One, to acknowledge that you had no conflict of interest. Oh, I'm sorry. I did have a slide. <laughs> oh, yeah. And we also <laughs> want to thank Boston Children's Hospital for their support. And as always, thank you very much Thanks, for Mary. coming. My pleasure. Doing a wonderful presentation. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everybody. And this concludes our presentation this evening. Thank you.